transmission. Okay, we, we are live. Uh, so Pablo, um, I will share my screen. I will say a few words before we start. Sounds good. Um, you need me to stop sharing my screen? Yes, I think I can do that uh, as soon as... I, I just stopped, so... Okay, all right, so... Uh, can can you see my screen? Can everybody see my screen? Yep. All right. So uh, welcome uh, everyone. Welcome Pablo and everyone to to this um, webinar. This is the first webinar of this webinar series in condensed matter and materials physics. Uh, Pablo, uh, before I introduce you, I will say a few words in, in Portuguese. Okay. Yes. Okay, pessoal. Então, é, sejam todos bem-vindos. Obrigado aí por participarem. Esse é o primeiro da nossa série de webinários, né? A gente vai fazer a cada duas semanas, sempre nas segundas-feiras à tarde, né? A ideia é fazer às quatro da tarde, mas hoje, especialmente, nós é, vamos fazer começando às cinco da tarde esse seminário, tá? Essa é uma iniciativa da, da Comissão Diária de Física da Matéria Condensada e Materiais, da, da SBF, é, e eu queria agradecer todo o suporte que a gente teve da diretoria da SBF em todos os aspectos né, relacionados a esse evento e, e também e principalmente aos aspectos logísticos né, de ceder a, a conta do, do Zoom e, o, e do YouTube da SBF para a gente fazer é, essa transmissão. Tá? Ah, o próximo seminário, como eu falei, vai ser a cada... A cada é, duas semanas, mas na, na, daqui a duas semanas a gente vai estar no encontro de outono da SBF, né? E, então não vamos ter esse seminário daqui a duas semanas e sim vamos pular e vamos para o próximo vai ser só no dia 7 de dezembro, tá? Então daqui a, daqui a duas semanas, como eu falei, o, o encontro de outono vai ser o outono é no, 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 na porção do Brasil que está ao norte do Equador, é, e a gente continua, então, no dia 7 de dezembro, com o seminário do Bruno Carvalho, é, da Federal do Rio Grande do Norte, que foi prêmio de melhor tese é, em Física da Matéria Condensada da SBF e, e prêmio de melhor tese da CAPES, com o título de Raman Spectroscopy in 2D Transition Metal Decalcogenides. Ok, so now, now I, should, I, I would like to go back to English and uh, I'd like to introduce our speaker today. Professor Pablo Jarrillo Herrero. Uh, Pablo is a full professor of physics at the MIT, where he joined in 2008 as an assistant professor. So since the beginning of his career, Pablo has been doing some uh, groundbreaking work in a variety of nanosystems from carbon nanotubes to graphene to other 2D materials. And in particular, uh, Pablo's recent work on magic angle Graphene Superconductivity was awarded the, the Physics World Breakthrough of the Year in 2018. And, and for this uh, award, for this work, Pablo uh, has uh, received the 2020 Buckley Prize of Condensed Matter Physics from the American Physical Society and also this year's uh, Wolf Prize in Physics. So it is a, a great honor to have uh, Pablo to open this webinar series in condensed matter and materials physics uh, of the Brazilian Physical Society. Uh, thank you, Pablo, for accepting this invitation. And uh, the floor is yours, or, or the screen and, and the microphone are yours. So let, let me stop sharing my screen and uh, please go ahead and you, you can start your talk. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rodrigo, and, and thank you everyone for for being here and and you know i i as you can see i, I choose a zoom background of the place where i i should be and where in fact let me unmute myself since the host muted everyone <laughs> okay so um i've been twice to brazil but last time it's already a, a little bit ago so i hope once all this COVID uh, thing is, is over, I, I will have the pleasure of, of, of visiting again and, and see so many friends that I have in Brazil. So thank you very much for, thank you very much again for the invitation. So today I want to tell you about, about Moiré quantum matter and our recent work in these systems, okay? 
But I want to start from a more general point of view, since I know there's you know a lot of people here in the audience and students, etc. So, what you know among the most fascinating states of strongly correlated you know states of matter that that are in the universe are those you know where the interactions between the particles are very strong. Okay, and this has, you know, this appears in many areas of physics, not just uh, quantum gluon matter physics. For example, this is, you know, strongly correlated states of matter appear in the quark gluon plasma, which is a state of matter that appears a few nanoseconds, microseconds after the Big Bang. And then we can recreate nowadays in, you know, heavy ion laboratories, like Brookhaven National Laboratory here in the US. The different phases of nuclear matter in neutron stars are also strongly correlated phases of matter. Here you have a picture from the Chandra X-ray Observatory of the neutron star. And if you go to Wikipedia and you go to a neutron star and the different faces that they have inside, they have all these fancy names. Um, uh, they call them nuclear pasta, you know, so you have the Bucatini phase, the lasagna phase, the spaghetti phase, you know, as, as usual, the astrophysicists are very creative at um, giving names to, to objects or phases of matter. And perhaps closer to, to you know, our heart to condense matter phases are the different topological states of matter that one finds for example, in the fractional quantum hall regime, okay, where this time is electrons interacting very strongly can give rise to very uh, exotic objects like fractionalized charges with all kinds of topologically interesting physics. So <clears throat> going now into the field of quantum materials, you know, there are many, many, many materials where you know, the interactions between electrons play a dominant role. Perhaps the most famous of these materials are the high temperature superconductors, okay? Where in a phase diagram of temperature versus doping, there are a variety of phases, you know, over which, you know, we have relatively little understanding even after, you know, more than three decades working on this problem. Now, before I, I go into quantum materials and electronic properties, let's, let me, let's have a look at, from the point of view of simple, you know, elect, you know simple uh, electronic one structure, what is the behavior that you, can have in materials from the electronic transport point of view, okay? So in single particle band theory, okay? You can have one of these two situations. Situation number one is when you have your density of states here as function of energy, and you have, let's say these two bands, one of the bands is completely occupied with electrons. And then there is a gap to the next band, which is completely empty of electrons, okay? When this situation arises, you have an insulator. Yeah? And the reason is that you have no available energy states at infinitesimal low energies where electrons can be excited via a bias voltage or via temperature in order for the system to conduct electricity. Yeah? Now, if on the other hand, you have a situation where your density states, similar to before, you have these two bands, one of the bands is completely full and now the other band is partially full, partially empty, okay? In that case now, let's say if your Fermi energy is here, your electrons have empty available states at infinitesimal low energy, such that they can get excited via bias voltage or via temperature and conduct electricity. So you have a metal, okay? So from single particle pan, you know, band point of view, in the simplest case, you have one of these two behaviors. Now, the moment you introduce interactions, this can get quite a bit more tricky, okay? For example, you can be in a situation such as this one where your Fermi energy is in the middle of a band, but now you do very strong interactions between your electrons, then a gap actually opens. This is a correlated gap delta so that you have a completely filled many body band, a completely empty many body band. So you go back to a situation which is very much reminiscent of this one, but where this gap actually is a correlated gap induced by interactions, okay? And in that case, you should have a metal in single particle physics, but you have actually a correlated insulator once you include many body effects. Now, these correlated uh, insulators, there are several types of correlated insulators. And one of the most famous examples is the MOT insulator, okay? And the mod insulator is particularly famous because it is believed the parent state of the high DC cuprate superconductors. So in high DC cuprate superconductors, you have these copper oxygen planes at zero nominal doping. That means actually one electron per copper atom. And now a very interesting dynamics takes place when you dope with some holes, you remove a few electrons and now these electrons can jump from empty side to empty side, 
they are forbidden to doubly occupy these sites because of the strong interactions. And a very interesting game takes place, which is believed to be described by a model called after John Hubbard, this is called the Hubbard model, where when you dop a mod insulator, okay, in particular with holes in this case, now the kinetic energy allows you to have hopping between these sites. You still have a competition with double occupancy, which prevents you from, you know, occupying double sites, you know, a, a sites with double occupancy. And it is believed, and I say it is believed because we don't know it exactly, but it is believed that this Hubbard model and the interplay that happens here between hopping and repulsion gives rise to this complex phase diagram as a function of temperature and doping. And I say it is believed because it turns out that this Hubbard model cannot be solved exactly, okay? So even after 35 years, 35 plus years of trying to work hard, you know, on this problem, this, this is something that we don't know yet how to solve exactly and how does this exactly relate to this. Now, because of this uh, difficulty in solving this problem theoretically, the community has been trying alternative approaches in order to investigate the physics of strongly correlated electrons. Okay, One of the most successful approaches is actually that of investigating strong correlated systems in ultra cold atom lattices. Okay, So, Already back in 2002, okay, so if you, if you shine you know, two lasers at each other, you can create a periodic potential in two dimensions where you can load atoms. And already in 2002, through a trick known as the flashback resonance, where you can tune the interactions between your atoms, they were able to realize the transition between a mod insulator and a superfluid due to attractive interactions. This was done back then with bosonic atoms. So this was a realization of the bose hubble model. A few years later, they were able to realize this with fermionic atoms, okay? And just to give you an idea, the state of the art, okay, is such that they have been able to realize anti-ferromagnetism in the fermi hubbard model due to repulsive interactions, okay? So as you can see here, these are, you know, atomic gas microscopes, you know, of, of this um, ultra cold atom lattices. And, you know, this color is indicated the spin, you can see short range anti-ferromagnetism in your system. So this means that the ultra cold atoms community is exploring this corner of the phase diagram, you know, mod physics, anti-ferromagnetism. They would like to explore the entire phase diagram. And in particular, this region where they expected to see D wave superfluidity due to repulsive interactions. But in order to reach down here, they need to substantially cool down their optical lattices. Okay? And, and you know, there is no fundamental obstacle in principle to doing this, but it is a very substantial technical challenge. Okay? They're already working at, at a few hundred picocalvins and they have to go you know, in order of magnitude so lower in temperature to reach this region of the phase diagram. So we have these two complementary platforms to investigate strongly correlated electrons, okay? One is to look at actual quantum materials, cuprates, nectites, et cetera. These, in these systems, the typical lattice scale is of the order of a few angstroms. An alternative is to use ultra cold atoms in optical lattices, okay? The typical length scale here, the separation between these atoms is of order of a micron. And what I wanna tell you about today is that there's now a new platform, magic angle graphene and related more systems, where you have a typical length scale, which is of order 10 nanometers. So it's very nicely two orders of magnitude from either of these two other platforms. So in that sense, magic angle graphene and other more super lattices constitutes a very complementary platform, you know, to investigate strongly correlated systems. Associated with these energies, with these length scales, you have energy scales. So in typical quantum materials, energy or temperature scale is of the order of 100 1000 Kelvin. In ultra cold atoms, you have about you know, 0.1 to 1 nano Kelvin. Because magic angle graphene, this length scale is intermediate, you also have an intermediate temperature scale, which is of the order of 1 to 10 Kelvin, as I will show later. Yeah? So with all of this, this is what I'm going to tell you about today. First, I will introduce to the materials Legoland and to Stronix in terms that you may have heard about. Then I will go to graphene and magic angle graphene super lattices. Then I will tell you about our observations of correlated insulated behavior and superconductivity. And then I hope to have a five, 10 minutes to tell you about some of the latest and the outlook. Let me start with this. So for now, you know, about 15 years, we've been having a lot of fun, you know, working with two dimensional materials. And one of the things that people 
realized quite quickly is that, you know, 2D materials are a bit special because you can just take them and stack them on top of each other, okay, arbitrarily. So this is something that, you know, my, my you know, it's analogous to putting Lego pieces on top of each other and my friends and, you know, and colleagues, you know, wrote this, you know, papers about how, you know, 2D materials and the vast materials and heterostructures are similar to Lego, okay? Now, I don't know how many of you have played with Lego, okay? But I play with Lego all the time because my, you know, I have small kids. And, you know, often my, you know, one of my children comes and tells me like, daddy, I cannot stack these two pieces of Lego on top of each other, you know, it's hard. And I have to tell them, look, this is because you have to align them perfectly. Okay, only if you have zero degree angle between the two pieces, you can stack them on top of each other. Okay, so now while this Lego aspect of 2D materials is a very important aspect, okay, I think that it may not be perhaps the most unique aspect of 2D materials. Something which is, you know, because after all, we also have metallic super lattices, MB grown semiconductor heterostructures, all of those rely on this Lego aspect. The thing that is perhaps un most unique about 2D materials and that has no precedent in the history of material science is that with 2D materials, you can do this. Okay? You can place one 2D material on top of another 2D material and rotate okay, at an arbitrary angle of rotation between the two 2D crystalline lattices, completely at will any angle that you want. You cannot do that with bulk growth of materials. You cannot do that with MBE grown semiconductor or metallic heterostructures, okay? This is something that you can only do now that we have 2D materials isolated and then we can stack them on top of each other with an arbitrary angle. So let me stop this before you get a little bit dizzy. Now, what about graphene and Majagani graphene? Okay, so I know, you know, graphene has a very strong tradition of work on graphene, both theoretically and experimentally. I know all of you are familiar with graphene. Let me just very quickly tell you. So graphene is a honeycomb of carbon atoms. All of these atoms are chemically identical, they're carbon, but they are crystallographically inequivalent. You know, turns out you need two, a two atom bases to tile a honeycomb. Yeah? So we call these the A and B sublattices, okay? The red and green carbon atoms. Now, we need a very simple uh, quantum mechanical, you know, type and model. You can calculate the electronic structure of graphene. And it happens to be very close to the Fermi energy to charge neutrality, this very peculiar electronic structure where you have a linear energy momentum dispersion. Okay, these are the famous Dirac cones of graphene. Okay? And this energy relation can be formalized here. This is the Dirac equation in two dimensions for massless particles. You can see the energy is linear in momentum, similar to photons. Okay, except that these are, of course, fermions. Now, in the Dirac equation, this spinner is usually telling you whether the electron has spin up or spin down. In graphene, this is a pseudo spin, which is telling you whether the electron wave function is on the A sub lattice or on the B sub lattice, okay? Now, the only other thing, you know, this is the only equation I'm gonna show in the entire talk. The only other thing you need to know for this is that we have two such valleys or double Dirac cones, they're called valleys, the K and the K prime valleys. So electrons in graphene have four degrees of freedom. They have spin up and spin down, ballet K, ballet K prime. Okay, that's all you need to know. Remember just number four, it will appear later. So now, what happens if you put graphene on top of graphene and you rotate the angle, okay? So what you see is that you form a moiré pattern, okay? A quasi-periodic pattern, okay? And the moiré wavelength, the distance between these soccer balls that you see in the screen is you know, goes as sort of as one over the twist angle, okay? So this can go all the way to infinity because these two lattices are identical, okay? In particular, it grows very fast as you go to a very small angle. Now, this is what happens in real space, okay? Let's see what happens in momentum space and therefore what happens to the electronic structure. So if you put graphene you know, this is, you know, this is graphene, this is the Dirac cones, this is the reciprocal space, okay? If you had some finite Fermi energy, this is the Fermi disks, you know, that you cross here at some finite energy. If we now put another sheet of graphene on top, if the two sheets are perfectly aligned, then you get a aligned 
reciprocal space and real one zone, okay? If you, however, now rotate by some angle, okay, the reciprocal spaces rotate also by the same angle and the Dirac cones of graphene sheet one and graphene sheet two get separated in momentum space, okay? By a quantity which is proportional to the sine of half the angle. So twisting leads to layer Dirac cones separating in momentum space. Yeah? Now, let's look a little bit more in detail at this situation. Let's start with an angle which is already small enough such that the sine of the angle is equal to the angle, okay? So this is a situation that would occur. The Dirac cones would look like this and they would interpenetrate each other if the graphene sheets, they didn't know, electrons in one graphene sheet didn't know that electrons in the other graphene sheet the other graphene sheet exists, yeah? However, because when we put two graphene sheets on top of each other, these are only three anstroms apart, okay? There is actually interlayer tunneling. This interlayer interaction or interlayer tunneling gives rise to bonding anti-bonding states, similar to a hydrogen molecule that you can have bonding anti-bonding states. This gives rise to bonding anti-bonding states at this crossing point, leading to a band which gets pushed down towards lower energy. Now, this is the situation when 2W is much smaller than the energy of this crossing point, but as you decrease the twist angle, this band gets pushed down to lower and lower values until it gets pushed down all the way to zero energy. And that condition, which is known as the flat band condition, is reached at an angle which was coined by Bistro and McDonald as the magic angle. Yeah? So that angle is about 1.1 degrees for graphene on top of graphene. Now, I should mention that there was very interesting experimental and theory they will work at about the same time, a little bit earlier actually, by the group of Eva Andre and by the theory group of Eric Suarez Moray, okay, where they already saw that indeed there was this formation of these flat bands. Okay. Now, this, you know, this is an actual calculation of those flat bands in this energy versus momentum. Okay, so flat in real in momentum space means highly peaked, okay, in highly localized in real space, okay. To go from reciprocal space to real space, you just have to do the Fourier transform. So when you have electrons in these flat bands, they happen to be localized, they like to sit in regions where locally the two graphene sheets have AA stuck in. Okay, these regions where electrons like to sit are tunnel coupled via regions of local A, B, and B, A stacking. Okay, because you have this angle, this local registry between the atoms varies as you move along the two graphene sheets. So then what we end up with, okay, from top, you know, point of view is we have our system, which consists of these A, A regions where electrons like to be. These are regions are separated by regions of AB and BA domains. This is, you know, now in a more, slightly more realistic schematic. This is going to form now our triangular Fermi Hubbard lattice. Okay, we're going to put our electrons here. These regions, AA regions, are spaced by about 13 nanometers. Okay. And I put triangular in quotes because in reality, this is still a honeycomb lattice because the AB and BA domains are not identical, okay? So this still has a honeycomb structure. Now, let me tell you about our experiments and our data. So <clears throat> this is the device geometry and the measurement scheme, okay? So we fabricate these devices where you have this twisted bilayer graphene which is encapsulated between top and bottom hexagonal boron nitride. This is a very high quality dielectric. The twisted bilayer graphene is contacted by source and drain electrodes so that we can apply a voltage and measure current. And then we have a metallic electrode, a gate, parallel with the twisted bilayer graphene so that we have a field effect transistor geometry. And by applying a voltage to this gate, we can vary the charge density in the twisted bilayer graphene. So now let me show you our data. So before I show actual data, let me remind you what does conduction through regular graphene look like, okay? So if you measure the conductivity versus charge density of gate voltage, 
in regular graphene, you have the following situation. If your Fermi energy is deep in the balance band, you have lots of holes here, and therefore you have a very high conductivity. If your Fermi energy is deep in the conduction band, you have lots of electrons, and you have also very high conductivity. If your Fermi energy is at the charge neutrality point, you have very few charge carriers, and you have low conductivity, okay? So the conductivity of graphene versus gate voltage is this V-shaped conductivity. And that has been seen by thousands of groups around the world. Okay? Let me show you what happens when we go to magic angle twisted by layer graphene. Okay? So these are data of conductance as a function of charge density in our system. Okay. Let me guide you through this data. If your Fermi energy, if your chemical potential, sorry, is here in the middle of this gap, okay, that situation corresponds here, corresponds to adding four holes per moiré unit cell. And because this is a single particle gap, we have a band insulator and therefore your conductance is zero. Okay? If on the other hand, you know, these flat bands can contain up to eight electrons per moiré unit cell. So if instead of having four holes or minus four electrons, we go to plus four electrons per moiré unit cell, again, our chemical potential is here in the middle of this band gap and we have zero conductivity, okay? Now, if we put the chemical potential here below charge neutrality in the middle of the valence band here, when we exactly add two holes per moiré unit cell, you can see at two holes per moiré unit cell, the chemical potential is in the middle of a band. We should be conducting very well. This should be a metal. However, we also have zero conductivity. This happens to be a correlated insulated state that appears when we put Two, elect two holes per more unit cell. If we now shift the chemical potential to the middle of the conduction band here, we have two electrons per more unit cell in our system. The system should be a metal in single particle physics, but it turns out to be an insulator. So this is also an example of a correlated insulator, okay? And this behavior that by now we and many people have seen only occurs when the twist angle between these two crystalline graphene sheets is very close to this 1.1 degrees, okay? Basically between about one and one, you know, between one and 1.2 degrees, that's the range, the angular range for which this correlated insulator physics happens, yeah? So now that's about the correlated insulators. Let me show you now uh, what happens when we add carriers to these correlated insulators. So when we were looking at these um, devices, okay, and I, you know, I remind you this is conductance, this is you know, charge density. By the way, I didn't mention it earlier, but as you can see, near charge neutrality, you have this V shape because this is still sort of graphene, keeps that graphene character at exactly charge neutrality. Now, when we're looking at this, you know, this is NS is the super lattice density for electrons per more unit cell. This is four holes per more unit cell. This is two electrons per more unit cell correlated insulator two holes per more unit cell correlated insulator. We were looking at this, we were doing temperature dependence around these correlated insulated states. And then, you know, when we were looking around the correlated insulated state for electrons, we realized that, you know, the conductance, you know, as you cool down, the conductance decreases. That's the expected behavior of an insulator. You cool down, less conductivity, that was okay. However, when we were looking at the correlated insulator state for holes, okay, Right at the insulated behavior, same was true. If you cool down from 1.7 Kelvin to 0.3 Kelvin, this conductance decreases. But right next to it, as we were adding a few holes to the system, you can see that this conductivity was increasing as we were decreasing temperature. So that conductance enhancement was very suspicious. Now, these devices, we measured them in a two terminal geometry, meaning we have source and drain electrodes, okay? We apply a voltage and we measure the current. Now, this two terminal geometry always adds a serious resistance to our device, okay? That's okay if you are trying to measure an insulator because if the resistance of your object is infinite, infinite plus something, it's still infinite. However, if you wanna see how good a uh, conductor an object is, and in particular, if it superconducts, you actually need to get rid of that serious resistance. So what we did is 
we prepared new samples in a four probe device geometry so that we can run a current and measure the voltage drop intrinsic within the device and see how well magic angle graphene wants actually to conduct. And when we prepare these devices, okay, so the first thing that we do is we may measure them again in a two terminal geometry because it's easier to characterize them first in that geometry. These are data for a new device with an angle of 1.16 degrees. These are data with a small perpendicular magnetic field applied to it. You can see similar to before, V-shaped conductivity near charge neutrality, <coughs> no conductivity at four electrons and four holes per more unit cell. You can see a deep here conductance at two electrons, two holes per more unit cell. Other stuff happens at three, at minus three. Okay, um, you know, a lot more is happening that I'm not telling you about right now. And then when we remove the magnetic field, you can see that things go crazy around two holes per more unit cell. In fact, if we now switch to our four terminal geometry in order to characterize the sample better, what we see is that magic angle twisted by layer graphene superconducts, okay? These are data for two devices, the resistance versus temperature goes down by several orders of magnitude below our noise measurement floor. This thing is a two-dimensional superconductor, okay? Now, you can measure the VI curves, okay? You can see here that we're running a finite current bias. There is zero voltage drop in our device. This is typical superconducting behavior until you reach the critical current at which it switches. You can do any test that you wanna do of two-dimensional superconductivity. The system checks it, okay? This is a two-dimensional superconductor. Now, as I told you, we can change the charge density because we have a gate and we have this field effect geometry. So one of the most interesting things about the system is that you can zoom in around the correlated insulated region. And by changing the gate voltage, you can now add, you know, you have at this region, you have two holes per motor unit cell, you have a correlated insulator, and then you add a few holes, you have a superconducting dome. You add a few electrons, you have another superconducting dome, okay? So when I saw this behavior, you know, this resistivity versus temperature and doping, I was really shocked, you know? This reminded me immediately of the hundreds and hundreds of times that I have seen pictures like this, okay? This is the phase diagram of the high temperature Cooper superconductor family. Now, let me, let me, you know, here in the cuprets, they put hold open in this direction, electron open in this direction. So let me flip this so that it's in the right direction. Okay. Now in the cuprets, zero doping means actually one electron per copper site. This is a mod insulator. You add holes, you have a superconducting dome. You add electrons, you have another superconducting dome. Okay. Here we have a two holes per more unit cell, a correlated insulator. We add holes, we have a superconducting dome, we add electrons, we have another superconducting dome. Now, of course, the big difference between these two, I mean, there are many differences, okay? There are only some analogies, other things are very different, but an important difference is that this is a theoretical phase diagram, okay? In order to make this phase diagram experimentally, you have to grow a different material Chem different chemical composition, often, often different material classes as you populate this doping concentration, okay? In our case, however, we can go from here to here in 10 seconds by dialing a voltage knob in a single device with a single disorder realization, okay? So that's something that, of course, allows us to investigate this in, in much greater detail as we tune in situ the carrier concentration. So now these are data for a different device, 1.05 degrees. You know, usually the superconducting dome for holes is much, much greater. We have here only a tiny dome for electrons. This is sort of the most symmetric we've ever seen it. Okay. Typically is a big, big asymmetry between the superconducting domes for holes and electrons. Now how strong a superconductor is magic angle graphene, okay? So, you know, on one hand, you could say, as you, as you could see in the previous slide, you know, the maximum TC is of order, you know, here in this data, 1.7 Kelvin. Actually, by now we have devices with three Kelvin TC, okay? But that's still much, much smaller than 
high temperature superconductor, right? For example. However, the way we physicists, condensed matter physicists, characterize how strong a superconductor is, is not just by DC. I mean, this is very important, you know, for example, for applications. But the way we characterize how strong is a superconductor is by you know, comparing how high is the critical temperature compared to how many carriers are there available to contribute to the superconductivity, yeah? Or in other words, how high is the Fermi temperature? So this is something which is typically shown in this plot. It's a log log plot of TC versus Fermi temperature. This is you know, known as an Uemura plot, okay? Now, in this diagram, most of the most of the conventional superconductors are in this corner. Okay, weak coupling BCS superconductors are in this corner. Okay, for example, aluminum. Aluminum has a TC of about one Kelvin, but it has an extraordinarily large number of electrons. Okay, Fermi temperature over a hundred thousand Kelvin. So, given how many zillions and zillions of electrons aluminum has that could contribute to superconductivity, its TC it's relatively modest. Only a tiny fraction of those electrons contribute to superconductivity. Okay, now the more you go diagonally up towards this region, the more exotic and exotic your superconductivity becomes. Okay, in particular, in this purple band here is where most of your unconventional, most of the unconventional superconductors appear. For example, you have here the cuprates, you have the nictites. You have the organics, the heavy fermions, okay? We even have here some, some data points from the ultra cold atoms community, okay? Here, lithium-6. Now, both axes multiplied by 100 million so that they appear here. Still, they can reach all the way to the BEC, BCS crossover region, okay? These have the strongest coupled systems that we have. Now, where is magic angle graphene in this diagram? It's here, okay? Magic angle graphene is the lowest density two-dimensional superconductor by far, by over an order of magnitude. It has a tiny Fermi surface, sorry, tiny Fermi temperature, okay? And still it superconducts quite decently, okay? There's only one other system, iron selenite monolayer, which is about the same strength, maybe a little bit more than magic angle twisted by layer graphene. Also an ultra high coupling strength superconductor. Now, some, you know, there are many, many questions, okay, related to this, you know, in particular, what is the origin of the correlated insulated state and what is the superconducting order parameter, okay? And in case, you know, you, you, you don't, you know, some of you haven't been paid much attention to the archive, you know, soon after we posted our discovery, you know, in 2008, there were like, you know, dozens and dozens, by now it's actually close to thousands of theory papers talking about this, okay? There are all kinds of order parameters have been proposed, you know, with all letters of the alphabet, you know, S, P, D, F, G, S plus P, D plus I, D, S plus P plus D plus F, you name it, okay? All kinds of predictions. I'm not going to comment about the varieties of all the parameters that have been proposed for this. Uh, you know, the, the first, you know, paper that appeared was the paper by Zenke Su and Leon Balance, you know, proposing the D plus ID chiral topological or the parameter. I actually want to talk about this second paper, Bolovic. Okay, so this this was a very interesting paper. You know, Gregory Bolovic, a very distinguished condensed matter theorist working in Finland, he sends us an email where he says, "Pablo, finally someone has realized everything that I predicted." You know. Which, you know, believe it or not, that's not the funny thing. It's funny, but it's not the, the most you know, strange thing because we get a lot of emails from theories like that, okay? But what was very interesting is that, you know, if you, if you look at this, this paper, you know, this paper is reflecting on a situation on an earlier paper that Volovic had written, which is the following. Going back all the way to the 50s or 60s, okay? About a couple of experiments per decade have shown signatures of very high temperature superconductivity in graphite. Okay. And again, the results not very reproducible, a little bit complex, you know, not, not clear the situation, but consistently about a couple of papers per decade 
showing high temperature support and activity in graphite, including room temperature in some cases. So Volovic in 2013, something like that, so already you know, well before our discovery, he wrote a paper where he said, look, this is too many reports to simply ignore this. Let me tell you what's going on here. All of these experiments have been performed in turbostratic graphite. Graphite where the graphene planes are stacked on top of each other with small angular misorientations, okay? If you have these small angular misorientations, you're gonna get flat bands and strongly correlated superconductivity with very high critical temperature. So in this paper, he said, look, finally someone has done the control experiment. You put two sheets on top of each other at an angle, you see flat bands, strongly correlated, you know, strong correlations, very strong coupling superconductivity. Now just get to put a few more and get to room temperature. Come on, stop, you know, start working, okay? So now I don't know if this will be true, okay? Uh, I'm sure many people are trying to add more and more layers and see how high we can go, okay? But it was interesting to see to see this paper. Now, in the last, um, you know, 10, 15 minutes or so, let me tell you about uh, some of the latest things that we, you know, we have been looking at. So, you know, we, we published our discovery in April, 2018, okay? And lots of things have happened since. First thing that happened is that we have reproduced our own results many times. Now, that, you know, that, you know, believe it or not, it doesn't always happen that you uh, reproduce yourself. So it's very good <laughs> that we did it, okay? We have by now many, many more superconducting devices. Actually, these are even all, you know, we have many more by now, okay? We're in fact starting to measure optimal doping DC critical temperature as a function of twist angle. So we have a dome here also in twist angle, okay? And as you can see, superconductivity occurs primarily between about 0.95 and 1.2 degrees, okay? Now, even more important than you reproducing your results is when someone else reproduces them, okay? So by now, many groups have independently reproduced our results and they have even extended them to other systems, you know, other mooring systems in very interesting research. First group that this, this was a group of Corey Dean in collaboration with Andrea Young, where they were able to reproduce our results and even extend them by applying pressure to the magic angle to the value graphing system. Very interesting paper. Second group was a group of Dimitri Efetov, where they found a number of superconducting domes, not just the, the, the ones that I mentioned before. Okay. This was very interesting that by now there's a large community that has been able to reproduce these results. Many, many other things have been obtained. For example, the resistivity of magic angle graphene is linear in temperature above the correlated region in density. This leads to very, you know, behavior which is very reminiscent of the strange metal and Planckian physics behavior in other correlated systems. Several groups have measured anisotropies in the system, in particular in our case, anisotropies in the critical parallel magnetic field and in the critical current versus parallel magnetic field. These are indications of pneumaticity in the superconducting state of the system, which points to a possible unconventional order parameter. This type of correlated physics, particular correlated insulated behavior has been extended to many other systems, such as magic angle twisted by layer by layer graphene. Now you have by layer graphene, the usual by layer graphene, you get another by layer graphene and you stack them on top of each other. So four layers this time, pairwise like this at a magic angle. And you also see correlated physics and interesting magnetic properties of the correlated insulator states. They have in many groups now that have been doing scanning probe microscopy studies, scanning tiny microscopy studies, scanning nanosquid, scanning near field optical microscopy, scanning single electron transistor, all of these are looking at the microscopics of the system, looking at something, for example, such as the twist angle disorder, looking at how interactions look like locally, how are these anisotropies locally in space. So these are all very interesting studies. Again, one of the most 
rewarding things for me is to, you know, to see that there's such a large community now experimentally that is working in these systems. And perhaps one of the most interesting developments is the fact that ferromagnetism, anomalous Hall effect, and even quantum anomalous Hall effect. So topology has been also found in the system, okay? In fact, this, this field of, you know, correlated more heterostructures is bringing together three of the most active condensed matter communities, okay? Which traditionally did not always talk so frequently, you know, among them. So one is the 2D van der Waals materials and heterostructure community. You know, another one is the strongly correlated materials community. You know, people that study cuprates, pycnes, nictites, etc. Another one is the topological condensed matter physics community that studies topological insulators, quantum hole physics, etc. All of these three fields come together in these correlated more heterostructures because these systems exhibit all of these components. In fact, not too, you know, not too long after our discovery, my theory collaborators, you know, and, and you know, and, and also my, my students and I, we published this paper. We we predicted that it would be nearly flat churn bonds in more super lattices with finite churn number, and hence with which would give rise to quantum anomalous whole physics uh, in a variety for a variety of more systems. Okay, there was a lot of extra theory work, and very soon afterwards, the group of um, David Goldhaber Gordon reported this large anomalous hole effect showing that there was magnetism close to quantum anomalous hole physics in, our, in the magic angle graphene aligned to hexagonal boron nitride. And a few months later, the group of Andrea Young showed this beautiful experiment showing quantized anomalous hole effect in the system, clearly demonstrating that topological physics is present in these correlated more heterostructures. The group of Feng Wang also showed similar uh, nearly quantized anomalous hole effect in ABC trilayer graphene aligned to HBN, another very interesting Mori system. So, you know, as you can see, there's you know there's quite a bit of magic in this Mori quantum matter in this correlated Mori heterostructures. You know, you have correlated insulator states. These have been measured in magic angle twisted by graphene ABC on HBN twisted by by TMD Mori heterostructures, etc. Superconductivity in magic angle twisted by layer graphene and some indications in other systems, although less robust. Topological phases have been measured in all of these systems, you know, also twisted mono by layer. Magnetism has been measured in, again, a variety of more systems. Nematicity in magic angle graphene. Why stop here? I think we should continue and discover, you know, all phases of matter, <laughs> hopefully, in these correlated more systems. In particular, a recent one which has attracted a lot of attention is Moiré ferroelectricity. Why not? It's another classical condensed matter behavior, right? Ferroelectricity, is it there in Moiré systems? The answer is yes. Fresh from a couple of weeks ago, okay, is the report by three independent groups. One of them, my group, another one, Moshe Ben Shalom at Tel Aviv, another one, the Manchester people in collaboration with, you know, uh, Magali, they reported the presence of ferro, the existence of ferroelectricity in bilayer boron nitride, in special type of bilayer boron nitride. Similar work, okay, uh, about flexoelectricity and other things in more systems was published by Columbia Group. Now, what is two-dimensional ferroelectricity? Well, you know, it means having a ferroelectric, a material with a, you know, permanent electric dipole moment in two dimensions. It turns out this is quite hard. I think this slide has all of the known 2D ferroelectrics, okay? It's something which is unusual. You know, typically ferroelectricity weakens when you make a material very thin, but still survives in a few materials, okay? Now, I will point out that all of these two dimensional ferroelectrics come from, or, you know, they, they happen when you exfoliate bulk polar materials, okay? Let me tell you about the special type of ferroelectricity we have found in parallel stack bilayer graphene, bilayer, sorry, bilayer boron nitride. Now, hexagonal boron nitride is this material which consists of a honeycomb of boron and nitrogen atoms. Okay, it's like graphene, but with boron and nitrogen atoms in the A and B sub lattices. Now, in the bulk, bulk hexagonal boron nitride is centrosymmetric. You know, if you have a boron 
atom in one layer, on top you have a nitrogen atom. You have AA prime stacking, it's known. Now, one layer of boronitrate, however, is non central symmetric. So if you take one layer, and now I'm going to draw these lines here so that you can keep track of these atom positions. And if you now break this one layer and stack it parallel on top of itself, you can see now boron atom has on top boron atom, nitrogen atom has on top nitrogen atom. Okay, well, you know, nitrogen, nitrogen, boron, boron. Okay, so parallel stacking has the hexagonal boron nitride layer number two non rotated zero degrees on top of layer one. For the natural stacking, layer number two is rotated 180 degrees with respect to layer number one. Okay, this means that parallel stack by layer HBM is non central symmetric. Now, this configuration with nitrogen atoms on top of nitrogen atoms, boron atoms on top of boron atoms is extremely uncomfortable for the hexagonal boron nitride. So the system actually decides, parallel stack boron nitride decides to go into an AB or BA stacking configuration where the boron atom sits on top of the nitrogen or the nitrogen sits on top of boron, but with empty spaces in some of the locations. Okay, this leads to actually a finite permanent dipole moment, which is opposite for AB and for BA. Okay, but for either configuration, you have ferroelectricity. You have an electric dipole moment, which is permanent there. Okay, so what we did is, like, okay, let's see if this actually works. Okay, so what we did is we took a monolayer of hexagonal boronitride, we broke it, and we placed it on top of it on top of itself with a zero degree angle. That's the parallel stack by layer BM. And then in order to detect this ferroelectricity, we placed another of graphene, a layer of graphene on top. This is embedded in thicker hexagonal boronitride and we have a dual gate geometry to apply an electric field so that we can switch the ferroelectricity. Okay? So we made, in other words, a ferroelectric field effect transistor. Okay, if you have a given dipole moment for your ferroelectric, there will be a type of charge carrier in your system. If you have the opposite dipole moment, you will have the opposite charge carrier. Okay, and indeed, if you measure such a device and you measure the resistance as a function of this buggy voltage, okay, you can see that if you go sweep your buggy voltage in one direction, you have a resistance peak of graphene. If you sweep back in the opposite direction, this resistance peak is shifted. You have hysteresis, okay? You can look at this hysteresis in a two-dimensional plot of the back gate and the top gate. You can see this diagonal is telling you the graphene charge neutrality resistance point, which switches abruptly when you go from BA to AB configuration. You now reverse your measurement. This switches back at a different point in this diagram. There is hysteresis. Sometimes we're able to catch the coexistence of AB and BA domains, and we have double peak in your resistance, okay? Now, this was for parallel stacking, zero degrees angle. Now, if you now allow, you make devices with a small but non-zero degree angle, okay, then you will naturally form this honeycomb structure with AB and BA domains. Okay, similar to graphene on top of graphene, but now these are hexagonal boronitride domains, A, B, and B, A. Okay? If we apply an electric field, it will be favorable for one domain configuration to grow, let's say the B, A. If we apply the opposite electric field, the other configuration will domain, let's say the A, B. Okay. So indeed, if we have fabricate these devices, these are data for a twisted bilayer boronite with a 0 0.6 degree twist angle, you can see that the ferroelectricity now shows these two peaks coexisting over a broad electric field range. This corresponds to the situation as we're going from one domain slowly growing the other domain type, okay? This is very different from the abrupt behavior we have for zero degrees devices. In fact, you know, very recently we have been able to directly image the ferroelectricity using vertical piezoelectric force microscopy. 
Okay, this is the phase image. This is the amplitude image. This is showing directly the electric dipole moment of these A, B, and B, A domains in a twisted bilayer boron nitride device. This confirms 100% our ferroelectric switching behavior that we presented before. Similar piece, you know, ferroelectricity through uh, vertical piezoelectric form microscopy was shown in these other two papers. Now, the last thing I want to tell you is that these are very robust ferroelectrics. This works all the way to room temperature and beyond. You can cycle this thousands of times. You can wait months. It retains the ferroelectricity. You know, I don't want to tell, you know, it's not very hard as, you know, it's not very hard to imagine the many, many things that you can now that we have these two dimensional ferroelectrics when you combine these with other two dimensional materials, okay? There's a lot more to come soon. Now, with this, I wanna end, you know, with this slide, uh, the field of correlated matter, more heterostructures has brought together condensed matter physicists from many communities, okay? The atomic physics community is also very interested in this system, you know, in some way you can think of these correlated more heterostructures as, you know, atomic physics simulators, you know, and I believe that this is a field that will grow very significantly in the next few years as we learn and we combine and we make more and more correlated more heterostructures with very different materials. So with this, I wanna uh, go to my last slide, okay, which is to acknowledge our collaborator, my collaborators. This is the work done by largely by Joan Sao and for some of the latest results by Danielle, by Jane, also by the Banden and Sentinel theory collaborators. Uh, Kenji and Shirui have worked on the uh, uh, ferroelectricity in hexagonal boron nitride. We have many international collaborators for local probe studies and I wanna also acknowledge funding support. And I wanna thank you, of course, all of you Brazil for uh, listening and I will be taking questions. Thank you, Pablo, uh, for this wonderful talk. Uh, I would like to ask everyone to unmute the microphone and, and clap your hands for Pablo. Let's uh, thank you for this great talk. And, uh, and we are now taking questions. We have already a question from the YouTube streaming, uh, a question from Alain Custodio. Uh, there, is there any evidence of exotic behavior for higher magic angles? That's the question. Okay, so I don't know exactly what um, the what, what uh, they mean by higher magic angles. Okay, if they mean sorry, Pablo, I had to mute everyone, but uh, you can unmute you. So. Uh, I'm not sure what uh, they mean by higher magic angles. So in the original prediction by Alan McDonald, he predicted a series of magic angles. And the first was 1.1, and then they go sort of as one over N. So the second magic angle is about 0.55 degrees, the third, etc. okay? So far, uh, we have not been able to find uh, exotic physics at those higher magic angles. Now, it turns out when you go about, you know, below about one degree, maybe 0.9 degrees, there is very substantial relaxation of the atomic lattices, okay? And that changes the band structure such that these other higher magic angles may not be as robust as the first one. So the community is still investigating to what extent there are those higher magic angles given this relaxation. Are they at the angles that were originally predicted or shifted? And if the flat band physics remains at those angles, okay? So this is still subject of investigation. Some people have looked at small angles, but they haven't seen superconductivity. They have not seen correlated insulator states yet. So we still have to, you know, they have some interesting physics, but not, not quite as interesting as in the, for the first magic angle. Okay, uh, so there's now a question from the Zoom uh, transmission, uh, a question from Belita Coiler, Belita. I think your microphone is, is mute. I cannot hear anything. Okay, so, uh, Hi. all right, now. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, very nice talk, thank you. Thank you. It was very nice to listen to you. But I think I missed something because I understand the 
parallactic phase mechanism, but I, I missed the driving mechanism for ferromagnet for magnetic phase. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, the 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 magnetism okay occurs when the bilayer graphene lattice. Okay, first of all, the ferroelectricity is in twisted or in parallel stack hexagonal boron nitride. You don't right. need graphene for it. Okay, the ferromagnetism has been seen in in several more systems. The, the first one was magic angle graphene, where one of the graphene sheets is aligned to the hexagonal boron nitride lattice underneath <laughs> it in the substrate. Okay? That alignment with that lattice breaks a symmetry you know, known as C2 symmetry, because now underneath the carbon atoms, you have one carbon atom on top of a boron atom and another carbon atom on top of a nitrogen atom. So that leads to a rupture, okay, to, to, to a broken symmetry in the system. And that broken symmetry is responsible now for the quantum anomalous Hall effect and for the presence of ferromagnetism, okay? And it's again, you know, interaction but, but, but due to that breaking of that symmetry. Very good. But I thought it was pure graphene and then it, I didn't understand. Thank you very much. All right, so um, we go from to a question from YouTube, Andre Gadelia. Uh, why don't you use graphite uh, instead of gold as a gate? Uh huh. So uh, a number of groups have used graphite as a gate. That's a very good choice. Graphite is very flat and uh, has little disorder. And uh, the interesting results have been shown with graphite. Uh, in my group, it you know it adds one extra step in the fabrication to do it with graphite and things have been working very well with metal. So um, that's why we haven't been using graphite. Although actually for some devices nowadays we use graphite gates. We also fabricate a lot of samples for collaborators and some of them cannot work with graphite gates. For example, if you use a scanning nanosquid and you're looking at quantum hole physics in the magic angle graphene, if you have graphite, you have the lambda levels of the graphite itself interfering with the signal. So it's much better to use metallic gates. So again, it's, it's, you know, there's no particular reason not to use graphite gates. We do use them actually for a number of our devices, um, but metallic gates also work and are better for some experiments. All right, so uh, uh, Marcos has a, a question from, from the chat. Let's go to the chat questions now. Marcos Pimenta. Uh, uh, yes, Pablo, very nice talk. Thank you very much. Okay, my question is about one about Raman spectroscopy. Uh, do, the, do you have the, the Raman spectrum of those, those metric angle samples? Is there some special feature about uh, superconductivity and things about that in the, Raman, in the Raman spectrum? So I have to say that to me, to my surprise, the Raman community has not been very active looking at this system. I don't know the reason. I remember when graphene appeared, 20,000 Raman groups immediately jumped at it, okay, to look at it. Uh -huh. To my surprise, I am not aware, I'm aware of Raman spectroscopy on large angle twisted by layer graphene. There's uh -huh. yeah. enhancement when you hit the Van Hoff singularity and so on. That's but right. to the best of my knowledge, no Raman group has looked in detail at magic angle twisted by layer graphene devices. I think looking at them with Roman would be very interested. I'm very surprised that, you know, STM groups, transport, scanning, variety, you know, so many people are looking into this. And for some reason, the Roman community hasn't picked it up as, as much. I don't know if, because all of the energy scales in this flat band are very small, of all uh -huh. the people people uh -huh. think they're not gonna see them. I actually think you would see a lot of stuff, okay? Okay, okay, let's talk about that. I'm very, <laughs> I'm, I'm glad to know that. Another, another short question about the ferroelectricity. In yeah. uh, the, the ferroelectric system with two uh, HBN, in that yeah. case, is that, there is no magic angle, right? You mean there is a, like a continual sis, uh, situation where you have uh, those domains, right? That's right. Uh -huh. That's right. If you, yeah. you know, uh -huh. these domains, you know, you will not have domains if you have exactly zero degrees, but uh -huh. it will be ferroelectric. The entire uh -huh. system will be uh -huh. AB or VA stacking, the uh -huh. entire system. It will be the entire system will be ferroelectric. Uh -huh. If you have a little bit of an angle, you will have AB and VA domain, and uh -huh. you will also be ferroelectric. 
Uh, Only if you go 180 degrees, uh -huh. you will not have ferroelectricity. Uh, I see. Well, that's very nice. Okay, thank you very much, Pablo. Then hope to see you soon here. <laughs> I hope so too. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, Marcos. So our next question is from André Fonseca. André? Yeah, um, thank you for your talk. Um, really appreciated it. Um, so at the beginning of your talk, you showed a plot of how the, the Moiré lattice constant depends very smoothly on the twist angle. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering why exactly do you get these very singular behaviors at these very specific magic angles, even though um, the physics seems to be changing very smoothly? So the physics the physics does not change so smoothly, but let me, uh, oh, what happened? I think I, I, I stopped sharing uh, my screen. Let me actually, I'm gonna go to, I will share it again. Let me find a slide where I have a, a hidden slide that shows the evolution of the electronic structure. Just wait one second. I'll be right away with you. Let me find it. Yeah, here. So let me share my screen now. Yeah. So this is an actual calculation of the electronic structure. This is energy versus Kx and Ky. I'm going to click run on this video. This angle will go from three degrees towards the magic angle. As you can see here, this is for twisted bilayer graphene at three degrees. This looks just like regular graphene within this energy window. As I click go, you see that the electronic structure gets massively reconstructed. There's these band gaps. And now at 1.1 degree, this band is going to become very flat. You see, very flat there, OK? So I'm going to run it again. As you can see, there is a particular sort of singular behavior. The band becomes extremely flat at 1.1 degree. And it's less flat at 1.3 and at 0.8 degrees, OK? So you can see this is a very flat band. This, is, this snapshot is for 105 degrees. When you have that very, very small bandwidth, now interaction effects become very pronounced. They acquire a very big importance because your kinetic energy is quenched. Your, your electrons don't have kinetic energy now, very little. That's why all of this physics occurs near 1.1 degrees because your kinetic energy gets very much reduced compared to interactions, okay? And that's why all of these strong interaction effects become pronounced. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Andrea. We have a question from YouTube uh, uh, from Leandro Lima. How do you measure the twist angle after placing one graphene sheet on top of the other? Very good question. So there are many ways of determining what's the twist angle. Um, from the transport, electronic transport, okay, you can look at what happens in a magnetic field. In a magnetic field, okay, you have Landau fan diagrams, you have Landau levels, which tells you what is the density of your system, okay? And you can identify from those Landau fan diagrams the exact density at which you have two electrons or four electrons per moire unit cell, okay? And once you know the density and you know it corresponds to four or to two electrons per moire unit cell, you know the size of your moire unit cell, which is directly, directly gives you the twist angle, okay? So that's how we do it from electronic transport point of view. The people that do local probes, for example, STM imaging, they can directly image it, okay? And their results are consistent with our results. All right, let's go to the chat. A uh, question from uh, Gabriel Schleder. Uh, is there, are there some favorable features of the single layer materials for showing exotic physics in the twisted configuration? So in the case of graphene, it is important that this thing can happen, that you can get these flat bands, okay? Now, there are other materials which are already, you know, graphene itself, just one layer of graphene is not a strongly correlated material. In fact, that direct cone, the kinetic energy of the electrons is very high, okay? So graphene by itself does not exhibit very pronounced correlated phenomena. When we put these two graphene sheets on top of each other at that angle, because of the quenching of the kinetic energy, you get this correlated exotic physics. Okay? There are other materials that to start with, 
they are more susceptible to correlations because they have already massive electrons, okay? Parabolic bands with massive electrons. For example, the transition metal dicalcogenides, tungsten diselenide, molybdenum disulfide, okay? Those materials, people have put, have made now transition metal dicalcogenides more heterostructures by putting one sheet on top of another, uh, you know, at zero angle or very small angle. And they have also seen interesting correlated physics in those systems. mod type insulators, vignette crystals, and very interesting correlated physics. They haven't seen robust superconductivity yet, okay, but it might be present. They, you know, those materials are a little bit harder to work with than graphene, but very interesting physics has been seen in these other 2D materials. Now, we have hundreds of 2D materials, many of which have interested correlated physics even in a single layer. So the community now is very interested in twisting them and seeing if that correlated physics gets modified when you place the systems on top of each other, okay? But that all remains to be investigated. It's, it's very early still in the field, actually. Great, uh, thank you. Thank you, Gabriel. Next question is from Ricardo Nunes. You have to un unmute your microphone. Yep. Hi, Pablo, thank you for, for the very nice talk. Um, can you bring back the, the plot where you have the, the band structure that shows the flat band? Mm -hmm. You see, th there's a very uh, strong electron host symmetry between the, 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 in, the, in the red bands, right? And your transport shows a, a very strong asymmetry when the FEMI level is in, in these very bands. That's so right. Do, do you understand why? Why yeah. the, the, the conductivity is so asymmetric yeah. for a system with such electron hole symmetry? Okay, I have to say that these calculations is a simplified model where indeed uh -huh. you see that there is symmetry. If you do a more realistic calculation, there is actually substantial asymmetry already at the single particle level. Okay. Okay. So okay. That, that's something, you know, as you may know, graphene seems quite symmetric at low energies, but if you go to high energies, there is actually substantial asymmetry in the electronic structure of graphene. All yeah. that high energy asymmetry gets folded down to low energies when you do this more super lattice. I see. So I the see. actual electronic structure, once you start incorporating, uh, you so know- So this is not a accurate picture. Power, okay. It's uh, asymmetric. In addition, okay, we have, when we put the chemical potential, uh, let's say at two electrons or at two holes per mole unit cell, in that density range, the electronic structure itself is quite asymmetric, okay? Around two or around minus two, okay? Uh -huh, uh -huh. In addition, we know from other correlated materials, such as the cuprates, for example, that there is huge electron hole asymmetry, you know, it's very different open air cuprates with electrons or with holes, okay? Uh -huh. And, uh -huh. you know, all of those things might be present here too, okay? So in some sense, I'm not very surprised that there is a strong asymmetry. It's there already at the single particle level and in many body, other systems show it too. So why not this and, one? And it seems that there is a tendency for the magnetic field to try to recover the symmetry when you show you show a, a plot with uh, zero magnetic field and one with 0.4 Tesla. And, yeah, no, it was not so much. What happens is that, what happens is that it's very dramatic, the effect of superconductivity in this plot. <laughs> it's not so much that it, it just, you know. Yeah, you know, yeah. The thing is that the superconductivity, of course, sends this to infinity, the two terminal conductance to infinity. And that's why it looks like, you know, a dramatic effect here. It is dramatic because you're a superconductor, but it's not so much that it restores the symmetry. What the magnetic field does is it kills superconductivity. I see. Um, and and, and our, our last question. Do you know if when you reach the magic angle, if, if the distance between the two layers change? So that's a very interesting- Can you measure that? So that's a very interesting question. As I mentioned a little bit earlier to, uh, in the response to a different question, there are relaxation effects that take place at these angles, okay? The smaller the angle, the larger the relaxation, okay, effects. The relaxation effects are not only in x, y, but are also in the z direction. So 
theorists have calculated now what is the displacement in the z direction okay, as a function of angle. And they see that it's finite, the displacement, and that affects at the single particle level the electronic structure. If it affects the electronic structure, it is likely that it may affect also correlations. Okay, so this is something that experimentally has not been investigated. This is something for the Raman, already right? Theory. Raman spectroscopist. Indeed, indeed. Could, could look into that, Marcus. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yep. Great. Okay, uh, thank so you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ricardo. We have another question from YouTube, from, a question from Luis Gregorio Diaz. Uh, is magic angle twisted by layer graphene a type two superconductor? And if so, do you expect vortex lattices for following the Moorhead pattern? Mm -hmm. Very interesting question. We have, of course, magnetic field data. I just, it's one of my hidden slides. Let me, let me show you here. Okay, so of course, magic angle graphene experiences a response in a magnetic field. You can see here, you know, the response in a magnetic field. You can also look at the resistance versus temperature at different magnetic fields and extract the superconducting coherence lens. You can do this at perpendicular and at parallel magnetic fields. It turns out the parallel magnetic field is very, very high because it's a two dimensional superconductor. So you don't have orbital effects or they're very weak in the parallel direction. And in fact, you can do all of this continuously as a function of density. So you have magnetic fields, you know, domes in magnetic field, okay? Now, you could see here that there seems to be noise here. It's actually not noise. These are actually Fraunhofer-like oscillations of the critical current. So this is Josephson phenomena, that when you measure the critical current as a function of perpendicular magnetic field, you can see these Fraunhofer-like oscillations close to the superconductor to insulator transition. You know, your system breaks into islands, okay? Now that's a longer answer than you ask for, but yes, it's type two superconductor. We have some evidence of vortex physics, okay? Although it has not been studied in detail, okay? But there is some evidence of vortex physics taking place at small perpendicular magnetic fields. And I think it, it merits uh, many more studies because I think it's quite interesting. As you know, in two dimensions, vortices are a little bit different, okay? In fact, um, you do have Meissner effect, you know, true Meissner effect in two dimensions, okay? Because, and this system, which has an ultra small charge density, even less, okay? So there are a lot of interesting things that can be done with vortex physics. Great, so a uh, question from the chat. Experimentally, are the magic angles achieved in a controlled way? Yes, very much, okay? We, design our devices, okay? I, uh, you know, we, we have a graphene sheet, we cut it in two pieces and we put one piece on top of the other and we rotate on purpose 1.1 degrees so that we make these devices. And we have a very high success yield for this, meaning in my group, not all groups are the same. We have a little bit more experience, but in my group, over 50% of the devices that we assemble have the angle between one and 1.2 degrees and therefore exhibit superconductivity, et cetera. That's over 50% of the devices. That's a much higher success yield than for many other projects that I have worked on. <laughs> so, so I forgot to say that this was a question from Marcel Albuquerque. Thank you, Marcel. So let me go to the last question from YouTube, uh, uh, from a question from Tony Miller Robles. Thank you for the talk, Pablo. Uh, my question is, is possible the emergence of magnetic skirmions in this type of systems? So in principle, yes. In fact, uh, not only that, there are some theories that predict that the superconductivity is uh, of a type called skirmion superconductivity, okay? No one has imaged yet these, but whether you're looking at magic angle graphene aligned to HVN, which is a ferromagnet, and you try to look at skirmions in this ferromagnet, whether you look at it in the quantum hole regime to look for quantum hole, you know, skirmion type physics, etc. cetera, um, it may well be that it plays a role. Skirmions play a role in the system, um, but we have not, you know, imaged them yet. Yeah, but I think that would be a very interesting experiment too. 
All right. Uh, another question from Marcelo Buquerque from the chat. Uh, what makes the AB stacking be different from the BA one, the BA stacking? Very good question. Let me see. I can go quickly to this. Yep, here. Sorry, I went too fast. Oh. Sorry, this is going a bit slow because of Zoom. Yes. So this AB stacking is different from BA because to go from AB to BA, you have to go through a topological boundary, okay? Through a domain wall boundary, okay? AB has in the bottom layer, let's say the A atom and the top layer, a B atom on top in a given configuration. When you go to BA, it's shifted, it's the opposite. You know, flipped configuration. And to go from one to the other, you cannot do that continuously. You have to go through a domain wall boundary, okay? So this is different from this. Locally, AB, if you have AB stacked by ledger graphene, the electronic structure, everything is the same as BA stack electronic you know, graphene. But for example, if you apply an electric field, you could open a band gap here, you could open a band gap here, and you would have a edge mode at this domain wall, a gapless conducting topological mode at this edge you know, here, okay? So that means that these two are not identical. To go from one to the other, you, go, you have to go through a topological transition, which in this case is actually a domain wall. Great. Uh, there's another question from Andre Gadelia. Andre, you want to, to say your questions? Okay, thank you. Pablo, thank you very much for your very nice presentation uh, for the Brazilian people. I have, many groups have reported that the, that the angle disorder is, is very large when you do the samples via the Terence Tech method. How do you uh, know when making the devices that you are choosing a very uniform area? I mean, uh, the angle is uniform through the area of your devices. Mm -hmm. Very good question. Well, first of all, many groups have mentioned that the twist angle disorder is very large. Very small or very large compared to what? You know, the first characterization locally over a large device of the twist angle was done by my group in collaboration with the group of Eli Selda at the Weizmann Institute. And we see that in a device that is very disordered in quotes, okay, but still exhibits superconductivity, the angular variation is of order 0.1 degree. Now, you may think 0.1 is very large, or you may think it's pretty small. Try to draw two lines parallel to each other, you know, within, you know, within 0.1 degrees, you will realize it's not that large, okay? So that's one thing. Now, it is true, however, that given that this magic angle physics occurs mostly between one and 1.2 degrees, you know, if you have a lot of disorder, then you're not gonna see this physics, okay? If you have on average 0 0.2, 0 0.3 degrees variation, it's gonna be hard to see this physics, okay? In our case, what we do is, you know, um, we're very careful with the way we fabricate our devices. We have substantial experience. Lately, we have modified our tier and stack because tiering leads to a lot of strain at the tier. So lately what we do is we laser cut. We use a laser to cut the devices. That leaves very clean cut between the two graphene sheets. Then we can pick one up, put it in place, place it on top of the other. And since we, since we started doing this, our devices are cleaner and even less disordered than they were before, okay? And we have an even higher success yield than we had before. So you know, fabrication methods continue to improve, okay? But the disorder, you know, again, it's large or small, depending on what you want to compare it with and for what purpose, okay? I'm actually quite amazed that we're able to do this thing at all, okay? You have to think about, this is like putting plastic wrap on top of plastic wrap, and it has to be pretty good over thousands of lattice sites so that this electronic structure 
anything like that is present, right? So the fact that we can do it, I actually, for me, it's actually almost a, <laughs> it's quite miraculous, you know. I, I would say the disorder is quite low, but yeah, depends on what you are looking at, you know, one could think of it as large or small disorder. Great. Please, so, thank you very much, Pablo. We have a question from Carlos Augusto Costa Mera. In your opinion, what is the source of this strong correlation interaction in bilayer graphene? What are these driven mechanism opening the gap for the angle 1.05 degree? I'm not sure if I understood the question. Um, the, you know, the, the interactions are Coulomb interactions, okay? So those are the interactions that people refer to when they say that interactions start to play a dominant role compared to kinetic energy. Now, interaction is Coulomb interaction. The question is what exactly is the correlate, you know, what is the many body ground state, which is an insulator state? You know, is it a mod insulator? Is it a Wigner crystal? Is it another type of insulator? Okay, those, that question still unsolved theoretically and experimentally, okay? We have some characterization of these insulator states. For example, we know that in a magnetic field, a very large perpendicular magnetic field suppresses the insulator state, okay? We know that it has a certain temperature scale, energy scale associated with this insulator state, which is much smaller than the band insulator gaps at full filling, okay? So we have some characterization of this insulator state, but we do not know yet the microscopic many body ground state that is leading to this insulating behavior. That is still subject of investigation, both in theory and experiment. Thank you, Pablo. Uh, let's make this the final question from YouTube. And then we have a couple of more questions from the chat. A question from YouTube is from Luis Alberto Terrasos. Uh, if you can dope, uh, what about the twisted by Lee, uh, impurity doping with transition metals, for instance? So with transition, I mean, the, to, to be the dopants be transition metals? Is that what the question yes. is? Yes, yeah, if you can dope with, uh, I know you do uh, uh, gate doping, but if you can also dope with uh, impurities, for instance, with transition in, metals. In principle, you can dope with impurities. Most people prefer to dope with gates because then you're doping in a clean way. You're not introducing chemical impurities. You're not introducing disorder. Now, there are some projects or some you know, physics for which you would actually want to introduce certain type of impurities, okay? And look like, you know, for example, in the superconductivity, you want to introduce a magnetic dopant and see what happens with the superconductivity around this magnetic dopant or something like that, right? So indeed, that such a thing can be done, okay? Uh, we, you know, I'm not aware of anyone that has uh, done it yet, but it can be done. Okay, so the last two questions from the chat. The one is from, again, from Marcos Pimenta and the, the last one from Aldo Jorio. Marcos, uh, oh, you can, uh, you can ask your question. Okay, uh, Pablo, my yep. question is about uh, electron phone interactions and, uh, and a Cooper pair. Is there some meaning to talk about those issues in uh, this kind of superconductor? So there are, there are people that believe that uh, because we have a very high density of states in this flat band, okay? Perhaps the origin of the superconductivity is electron phonon coupling, okay? Now, it is, if that is the case, it would be extremely unusual because most of the conventional superconductors where superconductivity is due to electron phonon coupling are in this region of the diagram. There's none which is in this purple region, let alone on the other side of the purple region, okay? So to realize this coupling strength with electron phonon, it would be extremely unusual. Now, I don't wanna say it's impossible, but it would be unusual. And some people, some theorists do think that it might be electron phonon driven in a very unconventional parameter range, you know? Someone, you know, someone told me, if this is electron phonon, is a very unconventional conventional superconductor. <laughs> you know, so it's a funny way of saying it. Now, we have performance experiments that I have not shown here, but the results are already in the archive, where we show that TC is highest in the region where there is a minimum in the density of states. So it's certainly not 
weak coupling BCS superconductivity with the formula where if you have a high density of states, you get higher TC. It's the opposite, actually. TC is the highest when the density of states is the smallest. Okay? Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. So now, whether some people have told me, some theorists tell me that electron phonon coupling in topological flat bands such as these is very different and can give rise to all types of exotic electron phonon, but exotic superconductivity. And we might be in that situation. I don't know yet, and I don't know the answer to that. It could be, okay? But um, it is, if it's electron phonon, is a very unusual type. Okay, because it's very hard to get this coupling strength through electron phonon coupling. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. Great. So, a uh, final question from Ado Jorio. Hey, Pablo, thanks for the, the talk. Nice to see you. Uh, my, my question actually goes on the same line as Marcus. Uh, you, you were talking, you have the flat bands. I understand they are more localized on the AA sites. Mm -hmm. And we believe this is where also you have the strongest uh, electron phonon coupling. You have these, you know, in the, in the previous times, pe people spoke a lot about the cone anomaly. Mm -hmm. And having these high density of states and uh, activating the, 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 let's say, the killing of the G band based on the electron phonon creation. This will be uh, an important effect localized at the AA sites. So do you have any uh, clue or anything related to this aspect that could be uh, behind this unusual superconductivity? So, um, you, know, I, I, you know, we don't have any evidence yet of what's the order parameter for the superconductivity, okay? We do not know. I can, you know, of course, you know, and this matter physics is not a democracy, but, but let me just say, maybe about 10% of the theorists thinks it's electron phonon, 90% thinks is interaction driven, okay? Electron electron interaction driven. But of course, you know, that doesn't mean that, that it cannot be electron phonon, okay? What I will say is that, you know, you mentioned the importance of the high, this high density of states, but as I, you know, the, the data point I can add is in, the region where the density of states is the highest, superconductivity is not there. And in the region where the density of states within this flat band, right? Within the flat band, there is a density of states within the flat band. There's, you know, it's highest in some regions in the flat band, it's lowest in others. In the regions where the density of states is the highest, the superconductivity is not there. In the region where the density of states is the smallest, the superconductivity is there, okay? so. That's the only thing that goes a little bit against the naive BCS formula, you know, the exponential of one over the density of states. But of course, once you are in a very strongly coupled regime where the prefactor is important, maybe and not the exponential, you know, then the situation may change and it, you know, deserves very much investigation. Okay? We do not know yet. Okay, thank you. Very good. Uh, so I would like once again to. I would like to ask you to open your microphones again and give a hand of applause to, to Pablo again for this great talk. This was a this was a great opening for our webinar series, and I have to thank it once again Pablo for being available, and uh, and and thank you very much. And uh, uh, hopefully we will see you in Brazil uh, as soon as possible. I hope and so. Very good. So I will uh, now stop transmission. And uh, once again, thank you everyone for participating. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. And thank you. And hi, Ado. I haven't seen you before. <laughs> yeah. Hope to see you in face to face sometime, Pablo. I hope so too. I hope so 